morning. Uh, my name is Mike Weaver. I'm uh, the chief of orthopedic trauma at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and uh, associate professor of orthopedics at Harvard Medical School. And I'm going to be talking to you today about the radiology and acute management of uh, pelvic ring injuries. So this is what we're talking about. So what, what do you do when something like this uh, comes into the uh, comes into the hospital. How do you uh, evaluate this patient and what's the initial management? You know, I'll talk a little bit about definitive fixation, but really it's what to do in the first few hours uh, and day to help stabilize and treat this patient. Uh, you know, pelvic fractures uh, can be intimidating and they're definitely life-threatening. Um, and, and there's a lot of different paths in their treatment. And so hopefully uh, today I can talk a little bit about pelvic anatomy the classification of pelvic ring fractures, uh, including uh, the radiology of both uh, pelvis and acetabular fractures, and then the initial management. And when we talk about initial management, we think about three things that really go together, and that's the resuscitation of the patient, the stabilization of the skeleton, in this case, the reduction and stabilization of the pelvis, and then some form of hemorrhage control to prevent bleeding, particularly in hemodynamically unstable patients. So as you know, the uh, bony pelvis is formed by two innominent bones that are linked in the back by the sacrum. Uh, you know, more important than the bony anatomy, though, when you're thinking about pelvic ring injuries and the stability of the pelvis is the ligamentous anatomy. In the front, there's a pubic symphysis, which is a fairly weak structure and is usually the first thing to give uh, in a ligamentous injury to the pelvis. And then in the back, these really stout ligaments that form the sacroiliac complex. There's the anterior SI ligament that's a little bit weaker, and then posteriorly some very stout ligaments, the uh, posterior uh, sacroiliac, sacroiliac ligamentous complex and the posterior portion of the sacroiliac joints themselves really form the, uh, the keystone to the pelvis and focusing your understanding on the disruption of the posterior pelvic ring and any disruption to these ligaments is really important. Again, the posterior portion of the sacroiliac uh, joints is a very strong ligamentous um, uh, uh, complex. Anteriorly, there is a joint space, but posteriorly you have these really stout ligaments that hold the pelvis together. Uh, coupled to the uh, bony anatomy is the vascular anatomy. And this is why these injuries are potentially life-threatening. There's a very uh, rich blood supply running through the posterior aspect of the pelvis. You have the large uh, blood vessels, the uh, iliac, uh, 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 arteries and veins. Uh, and then in addition to that, there's a rich venous plexus that surrounds the posterior sacrum that's called Batson's plexus and the pelvic floor. And so when you have significant disruption of the pelvis, these vessels can be torn and there's a lot of bleeding. Most of the bleeding does tend to be venous, um, but there can be arterial bleeding as well. When you're thinking about pelvic fractures and injuries to the pelvic ring, you know, keep in mind that the pelvis is a ring. And so if you have disruption in one place, there will be another disruption somewhere else. And so often the anterior injury is easier to see on your plane radiographs, but always be looking out for a posterior injury that can be more subtle. And that'll be linked to the first one. When we talk about classifying fractures, the most common classification that we use is the Young and Burgess classification. And this is really designed to describe the deforming force that, that injured the pelvis. Uh, the four types that you're going to see here are the AP compression injuries, lateral compression injuries, vertical shear injuries, and then combined injuries. Combined injuries can be a combination of two of those, or they could involve an acetabular fracture in addition to the pelvic ring itself. The uh, AP compression injuries are typically what we refer to as open book injuries, where there's disruption of the anterior pelvis and it hinges open. Uh, APC1 injuries are stable and involve a very small diastasis of the pubic symphysis. APC2 injuries are unstable injuries where the, the anterior ligaments are all torn, but there is some posterior hinge intact. So these typically open up five centimeters or less. Uh, there's disruption of the anterior part of the SI joint, but the posterior part is intact. The good thing there is by reducing the front, the back often anatomically reduces. And then APC3 injuries are the really bad players. This is a complete avulsion of the hemipelvis, uh, 
where all of the posterior ligaments are disrupted as well. Lateral compression injuries are very common in motor vehicle accidents, uh, particularly with a side impact. And here, the Young and Burgess classification uh, doesn't really describe how bad the injury is, but really just what is broken. So uh, LC1 fracture involves a fracture of the sacrum with unilateral rami fractures. These can be either stable or unstable, depending on the amount of displacement that the patient has. LC2 fractures involve what's called a crescent fracture, which is a fracture dislocation of the sacroiliac joint, coupled with those rami fractures. These are more often unstable and often require an open reduction. And then finally, LC3 injuries are a windswept pattern where one side of the pelvis gets pushed in and has either an LC1 or an LC2 pattern, whereas the contralateral side has an APC pattern and was actually pushed over. And so these are particularly nasty, nasty injuries that require urgent attention. Vertically unstable fractures or vertical shear fractures often a call from a, occur from a fall from height. And here, one hemipelvis is driven uh, superiorly. These can either be ligamentous, as in this diagram, or they can be fracture dislocations where there's either a sacral fracture or rami fractures or both. And, but again, there's vertical migration of the hemipelvis. Those patterns are particularly good to treat with traction initially to bring the hemipelvis back down. And that can be useful also to achieve your reduction in the operating room. Watch out for an L5 transverse process avulsion fracture. That's often a sign that there was a lot more displacement at the time of injury than you're seeing on your plain films in the ED. And then finally, Young and Burgess combined patterns. These are mangled fractures where there's a lot of disruption and it's a little bit hard to, to make heads or tails of it, or there could be a combined pelvic ring with an acetabular fracture. You know, there've been a lot of studies looking at how uh, classif classification systems are applied and there's a lot of variability. So instead of relying purely on describing something based on a cl classification system, I think it's better to use descriptive terminology when you're discussing these injuries. So is the anterior injury uh, the pubic symphysis? Are there rami fractures? Is it a volume uh, uh, increasing injury where things are spread apart or is it something where things are crunched together? Uh, what is the posterior injury and is that displaced? Do you see a sacral fracture? Do you see a sacroiliac injury? And then overall, what's the global stability pattern? Is the pelvis relatively stable looking and looks like a pelvis? Is it something that's rotationally unstable where something is either rotated in or out? Or is there a vertical component? You know, oftentimes when we're talking about the fixation and reduction of pelvic ring injuries, we talk about stability of the pelvis. And the stability comes in two flavors. Either pelvis is stable or it's rotationally unstable where the posterior ligaments, the back of the hinge is intact and the pelvis can either rotate open or closed, but the posterior part will hold together or something that's either vertically or globally unstable where the entire hemipelvis is free. And so kind of differentiating those two things can be very important in figuring out what the right treatment is. The other thing that's important to think about is pelvic volume. Uh, some fractures of the pelvis, particularly the APC type fractures, increase pelvic volume. The problem there is that more volume means more place for blood to accumulate uh, in the pelvis. So uh, you don't need to remember this equation, but just know that uh, the equation for a portion of a cone, which is kind of what the shape of the inside of the pelvis is, is related to radius of the, to the second power, right? So the square of the radius. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you have even a few centimeters of diastasis in the front, you can double or triple the volume inside the pelvis very quickly. And so these are injuries that can lead to a large amount of blood loss. Uh, patients can lose liters of blood into their pelvis, and these are potentially life-threatening injuries uh, when untreated. Uh, switching gears a little bit to radiology, when do you need x-rays? I think any blunt uh, force patient that presents uh, to the ED should have uh, uh, x-rays of the pelvis. Um, here in the States, we send people to the CT scanner often for advanced imaging. Uh, and so in those situations, if the patient's going directly to the CT scanner, you don't always need a, a pelvic x-ray, but I find that it's very helpful in figuring out the initial treatment of these patients. So I push for it whenever I can. When you are uh, interpreting your x-rays, you want to have a systemic approach. So let's talk a little bit about x-rays. So 
this is a classic AP pelvis x-ray. I've never seen one look quite this good in a trauma patient, um, but you want to have a systematic approach. I personally start in the front and then move to the back. So the first thing I do is my eye goes to the pubic symphysis, and I look to see if there's any diastasis or widening. I then look across the rami to see if there's any sign of any ramus fracture. Usually they're going to be coupled, superior and inferior. Then I look to the iliac crest, where you would see a crescent fracture exiting at some point there. I look at the anterior portion of the sacred iliac joint, and you should be able to compare that to the contralateral side. If you look carefully, you can often see the posterior aspect as well. And then last, I look at the sacrum. And looking at the neuroframen in particular is going to be the way to pick up a subtle injury. Oftentimes, there's a little wrinkle or buckle through one of the foramen, and that's going to be the tip-off that there's a uh, zone one or two sacral injury. And then finally, I take uh, you know the, the congruence of the iliopectineal and ilioshial lines. As they come up, they should meet the bottom of the second sacral neuroframen. If they don't line up with the bottom of the second, that could be an indication that there's been vertical migration of the hemipelvis. And then finally, I look out for that transverse process fracture. Again, if the L5 transverse process is avulsed, that's a sign that there was a lot more displacement at some point. Um, so that's how I kind of approach looking at a pelvic x-ray when I'm looking at the pelvic ring. But the other kind of injury that we often see in the pelvis are acetabular fractures. And when I look at the x-rays for that, it's a slightly different approach. And there I'm looking for what are called the six cardinal acetabular lines. There's the iliopectineal line, the ilioischial line, the acetabular dome or sourceal, the anterior wall, the posterior wall, and the teardrop. In addition to those six cardinal lines that were described by Jude and Letronel, I also look at the obturator ring because that's very useful in classifying fractures and Shenton's line, which is a way of determining if there's a hip dislocation. So again, here's that same pelvis. The first thing I look for is the iliopectineal line. And this runs from the sacroiliac joint across the acetabulum and down the superior border of the pubic ramus. That represents the anterior column. I then look at the ilioischial line, which also starts at the sacroiliac joint runs along the quadrilateral plate and then to the superior border of the inferior pubic ramus. Again, this is the ilioischial line, and this represents the posterior column of the acetabulum. The sourceal is the radiographic dome. The teardrop is really a confluence of two different parts of the pelvis. And if you see disruption of that, that can be a sign that the, uh, the fracture exits inferiorly through the acetabulum, like in a T-type fracture, for example. And then if you look very carefully, you can always see the posterior wall and the anterior wall. And the trick there is to, to look at the lateral border of the dome, and then for the posterior wall, to have your eye track down and look at the lateral border of the ischium. For the anterior wall, it's going to start in the same place, the lateral border of the dome, but it's going to track down to the inferior border of the superior pubic ramus. And then finally, I look at the obturator ring to see if there is a disruption there. And then this is Shenton's line. It's the congruity of the calcar and the inferior portion of the femoral neck as it curves around, and it should line up to create a smooth arc with the inferior border of the superior pubic ramus. If that line is disrupted, that's a sign of a hip dislocation. Certainly, most hip dislocations can be picked up pretty easily because there is not congruence of the head under the dome. But every so often, you'll find one where it's just posteriorly dislocated, and the joint space itself actually looks OK. But Shenton's line will be disrupted, and that's a sign that the, that the hip is out the back, and it's just happened to line up with the dome well. So again, when you put it all together, these are the things, right? The six cardinal lines plus the obturator ring and Shenton's line. So when you're looking at an acetabular fracture, and you're going to get a talk later on, on the classification or treatment of those, but those are the lines that you want to look to to kind of define those injuries. For the acetabulum, in addition to the AP pelvis, we use advanced imaging. We use Jude views, which are basically orthogonal views of the pelvis. And you're basically taking 45-45 views um, uh, to look at the joint. The obturator oblique uh, is uh, with the patient turned 45 degrees towards the x-ray beam. And so you're basically looking right down the obturator ring, whereas the iliac oblique is the opposite. They're turned 45 degrees away. 
So here's an example of a patient with an acetabular fracture. It's a little hard to see on the AP, but it involves the left side. So we'll get some Judea views to better figure it out. This is the iliac oblique of the left hip and an obturator oblique of the right hip. So on the right side, you can see this is the anterior column. We no longer call this the iliopectineal line. We call it the anterior column and the posterior wall. So the obturator view lets you see the anterior column and the posterior wall. And then on the left hip, it's the iliac oblique. So the nice thing is you have both on one and there's the posterior column. Again, it runs from the, post, the sacroiliac joint along the greater sciatic notch. You see the ischial spine and then down to the ischium itself and then the anterior wall. So on this view, you don't see any disruption. Everything looks fine. Here's the other side. Again, it's an iliac oblique of the right hip. There's the posterior column, everything's intact. And then the anterior wall. And now we see the injury on the left side. There's the anterior column that's intact and the posterior wall. So this is a displaced posterior wall acetabular fracture. Here's an example of looking at these for a pelvic ring fracture. So again, we look toward the front first. The pubic symphysis is reduced. We notice superior and inferior pubic rami fractures on the left side. The brim of the pelvis is okay. And if you look really carefully in the back at the neuroframen, you notice there's a asymmetry. There's a fracture of the left uh, sacrum through zone two. So two injuries. Again, with pelvic ring injuries, you're gonna see a front and a back. This is that example we started with at the beginning of the talk. Big diastasis in the front. It's easy to see that. But if you look carefully, you can also see in the back, there's a dis disruption of the right sacroiliac joint. So this is an APC3 injury with complete dissociation of the right hemipelvis. CT scans are incredibly useful to really define the anatomy of a pelvic injury, but you don't need them for the initial treatment. You know, if you can get one in a stable patient, they're obviously helpful, but again, they, they don't guide the initial treatment. They're certainly helpful for guiding uh, sacrosacral, sacral fixation, for example. So I always get a CT scan before going to the OR if I can, but, but you don't have to have it for that first initial treatment. They're really good at defining the posterior injury because that's the hardest thing to see on the plane films. And so here you can see the axial cuts show you either a complete disruption of the right sacroiliac joint, again, something like an APC3 injury, or in the other example, a zone one fracture uh, of the sacrum, which is compatible with a lateral compression injury. So switching gears a little bit to uh, the treatment of these, the reason that these can be a problem is bleeding. So fracture displacement can, can tear arteries and veins. It can lead to an increased volume of the pelvis where you lose a tamponade effect of a, of a blood clot. And when there's a lot of disruption, that hemipelvis is unstable and it can move. And that, move, that movement can disrupt the clot. And then in a really bad fracture, you know, a lot of fascial planes are disrupted and blood can really track up and down uh, the patient. Bleeding can be from uh, the corona mortis, which is a nastomosis between the obturator and iliac system that runs over the superior pubic ramus. So some lateral compression fractures are associated with a lot of, a lot of bleeding there. Here in the States, we use a lot of angiography to control bleeding by directly coagulating vessels and using embolization. When you look at mortality in blunt force trauma patients, you know, the first wave of mortality is in the first few minutes, and that's usually from a blunt force trauma to the head or massive hemorrhage. These patients are not salvageable. So there are patients that unfortunately uh, die at the scene. Then you have a group of patients that die within hours, and this is from bleeding. And this is really where bad pelvic fractures uh, lie and where you have a chance to make a difference. And then there's a third wave of mortality that's related to uh, the systemic inflammatory response to trauma, multi-organ failure, and, and uh and problems with the lungs in the ICU later. So when you're when you're working on pelvic fractures, you're really trying to decrease that the patients that are dying in the first few hours of their trauma from bleeding. You know uh, the ATLS principles of airway, breathing, circulation are where you start with all of these big polytrauma patients. 
pelvic trauma really fits into C, circulation. You need, a, you need to prevent the bleeding from the pelvis to save the person's life. If you have a patient with a displaced pelvic ring injury, that's a sign of a really high energy trauma. You know, you gotta be very careful with your survey and look for other injuries as well. And you wanna assess for the bony stability of the pelvis. We're gonna come back to this a couple times, but I think when you're managing these patients, you wanna be thinking of three things in, uh, at the same time. You wanna be thinking about the resuscitation of the patient. You want to be thinking about how you can stabilize the bony skeleton to prevent further bleeding and reduce the volume of the pelvis. And you want to think about how to control a hemorrhage directly. The resuscitation of the patient starts with saline. Most trauma patients are going to get one to two liters of saline on their way into the hospital. But after that, you want to switch to blood products. These patients aren't bleeding saline, they're bleeding blood, and that needs to be replaced. Often, uh, when you have a, a patient that needs multiple units of blood, you want to give them a combination of pack cells, fresh frozen plasma, and platelets to, res to re re uh, restore all the clotting factors that they're using trying to stop their own hemorrhage. There are some centers here that are using whole blood, which I think is another great option in the, uh, in the resuscitation of these patients. And you want to keep the patient warm. They're bleeding, and if they become coagulopathic because they get cold, they could die. So it's important to warm the patient and, and perform an aggressive resuscitation. At the same time, you wanna think about how to stabilize the pelvis. So the most common way to do that here is to use a sheet or binder. I think a sheet is perfectly fine and works just as well. Then kind of stepping up into the more invasive, more difficult things, applying an external fixator, uh, a C-clamp, which is a tool that's particularly useful for posterior injuries, or even taking the patient emergently to the OR for a uh, fracture surgery. Uh, pelvic sheets are easy to put on and can be life-saving. We have a couple patients a year that are their lives are saved in the emergency room by our residents putting on either a sheet or binder. When in doubt, you put it on. Don't worry too much about the fracture pattern. Sheets don't really help too much for lateral compression injuries, but if you're not really sure what the pattern is, if you apply a sheet, it can help stabilize things no matter what it is. The key to sheeting is to place the sheet low around the trochanters. It, it can be over the crest of the pelvis, but it really does need to be low over the trochanter as well, and it needs to be really tight, as tight as you can do it by hand, but you shouldn't use a broom handle or some other tool to make it too tight. I also think wrapping the knees and toes is useful to bring the pelvis together. This is what it looks like on a patient that we took to the operating room in their sheet. They have a sheet around the greater trochanters that's tied and clamped, and then a sheet around the knees, the other trick that I often do is to use foam tape and just tape the toes together. Keep those feet together, keep the legs together and reduce the pelvic volume. Again, around the trochanters. Use the trochanters in the hips as an indirect way of bringing the pelvis together. You don't want this too high. And then it can be left in place if the patient needs an x lap or some other abdominal surgery. And then bring those feet together. Again, now I've actually gotten to just taping the toes. External fixation is used to provide either temporary or permanent stability. We still use this occasionally as our definitive management for, uh, for some pelvic ring injuries. It's really good at controlling the anterior pelvis, but it's, the, it's, it's pretty far away from the posterior elements and doesn't control the posterior pelvis very well, but that's okay. It provides stability and holds things, which allows clots to form and, and it allows um, the hemorrhage to get controlled. A C-clamp is a tool that's used to reduce the posterior pelvis. This is a little trickier to use uh, and, and can be dangerous. You need fluoroscopy to put it on safely, but basically it's a clamp that pins the, the sacroiliac joints together and squeezes down the posterior pelvic ring. This is something that we don't use very often, but can be a useful tool in some injuries that are really displaced in the back. And then finally, ORIF, right? This takes a little bit more time, but particularly clamping and, and plating the anterior pelvis can be done fairly quickly if you have the right tools. Um, and, and that definitely addresses stability. But in, the, in an unstable patient, you probably don't want to do this. And then finally, stopping the bleeding, right? It's important to stop the bleeding. Here in the States, there are two ways that we do this. One is with angiography, and the other is retroperitoneal packing. So angiography is probably the standard here. 15% of patients have direct arterial bleeding uh, on angiography and bed pelvic fractures, and that can be directly controlled with coiling. 
Even if it's just venous bleeding, though, you can use gel foam to knock out the bilateral internal iliacs. That lasts for 24 to 48 hours before it recannulizes. But during that time, the bleeding is really controlled. And then we call that damage control angiography. And most centers in the United States use that as their primary hemorrhage control in bad pelvic fractures. Another tool that I've personally found very helpful, though, is retroperitoneal packing. It's a similar in concept to packing the abdomen, except everything is kept within the retroperitoneum. You're basically applying packs to directly apply pressure, stop bleeding, and fill a space within the pelvis. It's only useful, though, if the pelvis is in some way stabilized. You need an X-fix or some form of stabilization of the pelvis to hold the bones together so you have something to pack against. Otherwise, you're just going to push things apart with your lap pads. There have been some studies that have shown that this has been very effective in reducing mortality in, uh, in pelvic ring injuries. It's much more commonly done in Europe, but there are some centers in the United States that are doing this as the routine treatment for pelvic bleeding. As far as the technique, you want to do a lower midline incision. For damage control reasons, I favor a vertical incision, but you must reduce and temporarily fix the pelvis, and then four to six packs in either hemipelvis. And then they need to come back to the operating room for exchange in ideally 48 hours, but maybe 72 to exchange the packs or remove them, depending on how the patient is doing. So I'll go over the anatomy for this procedure. So this, is a, this was something that we did on a cadaver, but uh, it shows the anatomy nicely. In the traumatic setting, I would favor a vertical incision, although you can use a traditional fan and steel or transverse. In this particular example, for the skin incision, I did use a fan and steel, but again, in a trauma patient that's unstable, I would do a vertical incision because it's a little faster and a little easier to find the midline. Once you make the incision, you find the rectus muscles and you identify the linea alba and split that linea alba to find the retropubic space, which is pretty straightforward. You then pull that aside, and now you can see the bladder uh, deep within the patient. You want to protect that. Often I'll place a lap pad or a malleable retractor there to protect the bladder. And then you can apply a clamp. So if you have an APC injury, which is going to be the most common reason to do this, you can then apply a, a clamp to the symphysis. And then you pack deep into the pelvis, right? It's not on top of the pelvis. It's deep into the true pelvis against the quadrilateral plates. Oftentimes, having a combined approach where you initially sheet stabilize the patient or use a binder, perform temporary fixation and packing, and then angiography if there's per persistent bleeding, this has been shown to have probably the best uh, outcomes when it comes to mortality and pelvic ring fractures. This is the protocol that we use here at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. If you have a patient that comes in and they're hemodynamically stable and they have a pelvic ring injury that's stable, then we observe those and most of those patient patients are treated non-operatively. If you have a hemodynamically patient, stable patient that has a displaced uh, fracture, then that's someone that needs to be reduced. So they need to have a sheet. They may need traction if it's vertically unstable. And probably at some point in their first day or two of their hospitalization, they're going to go to the OR for definitive management of their pelvic ring, but it's not an emergency. If you have a hemodynamically unstable patient, so someone that's hypotensive, they need to be resuscitated. If their pelvic fracture is fairly minor and non-displaced, this is someone that may have some bleeding in the pelvis related to an arterial injury, so angiography may be helpful, but you really want to look for another source of bleeding in this patient. If you, have, if you have a patient that's hemodynamically unstable and they have a badly displaced or unstable pelvic ring injury, these are the patients that require emergency surgery. So these are the people that we would emergently exfix and then either pack or send to angiography depending on the resources that you have. So bringing this all together into a case, this is a, a, a patient from uh, actually just a few weeks ago uh, here at the Brigham. So a 44-year-old gentleman uh, who comes in and a motorcycle collision. He had an open left femur fracture, an amputation of his left hand, and he came in uh, hemodynamically unstable with this pelvic ring injury. So obviously he has a lot going on, but this is someone that really needs to go to the operating room. So he has an APC2 injury bilaterally. So the front is fairly displaced. The pubic synthesis itself is intact, but the pelvis is wide. And if you look in the back, you can see that both sacroiliac joints are widened. So this is a bad injury uh, and a life-threatening one that needs uh, urgent treatment in addition to his other injuries. So he was brought to the operating room for external fixation 
You can see here the external fixator pins and the volume of the pelvis has now been reduced. It's a near anatomic reduction of the anterior pelvic ring with still some slight gapping of the sacroiliac joints posteriorly. And you can see the retroperitoneal packs uh, from the lap plans, again, deep in the pelvis, not on top, but deep inside the true pelvis against the quadrilateral plate. So this was our initial damage control uh, setup. He then went to angiography, and two days later, we removed the packs. And so this is where he was uh, at that time. You can see the external fixator pins from the left femur. After he had been resuscitated, we brought him back for definitive fixation of the pelvic ring. Given the anterior injury, we actually elected to use an external fixator as the definitive fixation. So we performed bilateral uh, posterior pelvic ring fixation, sacroiliac fixation on the left side, transsacral fixation on the right, and then converted him to what we call a Hanover frame, uh, which is a little bit easier on the patient, two pins in the front with an anterior frame. This is what things look like uh, immediately following his injury and definitive surgery. And then this is him seven months later uh, with his fracture healed and uh, walking well and doing well. So in summary, it's important to recognize displaced pelvic fractures as potentially life-threatening injuries, be able to recognize fracture patterns on x-rays and be able to communicate them. And again, I think that it's very useful just to use descriptive terminology. You don't need to get too fancy with the classification systems, just say what it looks like. Obtain uh, radiographs on all blunt force uh, trauma patients and a CT scan to confirm diagnosis and plan your definitive fixation if you can. And the emergency management of these patients is required for displaced fractures, particularly in those patients that are hemodynamically unstable. These are life-threatening emergencies. You want to resuscitate these patients adequately. Think about one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. So you want to replete both the blood cells that they're losing with the plasma and the platelets to allow them to clot and heal their injury. You want to stabilize the, stabilize the pelvis. That involves a sheet to reduce the pelvic volume and to keep things stable to allow that clot to form and allow it to work. Or you might consider external fixation, a C-clamp or ORIF, depending on the situation and your resources, and then do something to stop the bleeding. If you have access to angiography, again, in the States, that seems to be the standard. I personally have found pelvic packing to be extremely effective, and this is something that you can do just with some lap pads. But you, again, when you're doing pelvic packing, you do need some way of stabilizing the pelvis first so you have something to push against. So kind of coming back to this, this is the triad of treating patients with displaced pelvic fractures. Resuscitate them and restore their blood products, stabilize the pelvis, and control their hemorrhage. Thank you.